Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tunnel and Warren Chapel, United Methodist Churches. I'm Pastor Rick, and here on October 4th of 2020, we are celebrating World Communion Sunday when all Christians, no matter whether they're Eastern Orthodox or Catholic or Presbyterian or Baptist, they're all called and invited to celebrate Holy Communion. And this is an exciting day that all of us are brought together by the Spirit as we remember our Lord through the bread and the juice or the wine. So I want to welcome you. And if you've got any elements around the bread or if you've got juice, please get those ready. You can do that uh, during the first hymn if you haven't done so already. Are you burdened by rules and laws? Come to Christ, the cornerstone of love. Are you scared of your own need for perfection? Come to Christ, the cornerstone of love. Are you scattered and confused? Like many of us are in COVID-19, during no COVID-19 pandemic. Come to Christ, the cornerstone of love. Come to Christ, our rock and our redeemer. For Christ's love is sure and God's mercy is great. There is no greater gift, no greater reason for living. Come to Christ, the cornerstone of love.
Let us pray. Glorious God, you are so our gracious God, and we ask to sh you to shine upon us with your wisdom. Call us into your kingdom. Help us to hear your words that our hearts, they might be transformed in, into your likeness. Help us to know your grace, that our lives may be transformed into your love. Speak to us now, O Lord, that the clutter of our lives might be cleared away. We want to know you. We want to be like you. We want to press on to the prize that is your kingdom on this earth. Make it so, Lord. Make it so. Hey kids, I'm so glad that you could be with us this morning. I'm excited to be able to talk to you. I mean, the electric lights that we have today are so common that we never even give them a thought. I mean, this is an old fashioned light bulb. Now we have LEDs, we've got the, the pigtails that are the fluorescence. But if I were changing the light bulb and dropped one and broke it, I wouldn't worry about it too much. I'd just go get another one. And that hasn't always been true. I heard a story about when Thomas Edison was working to invent this crazy contraption called a light bulb. It took a whole team of men working for 24 hours just to put one light bulb together. And the story is told that when Edison's team was finished with one light bulb, they, they gave it to a young boy to carry upstairs. Step by step, he, he carefully carried it, afraid that he, he might drop this priceless piece of work. You can probably guess what happened. That poor boy dropped the bulb at the top of the stairs. It took the team of men 24 more hours to make another bulb. Finally tired and ready for a break, Edison was ready to have his bulb carried upstairs. And you know what? He gave it to that same young boy who had dropped the first one. Now that's true forgiveness. Mr. Edison gave the, that boy another chance. You know what? God offers that same kind of forgiveness. He offers us as human beings a second chance and a, and a third. Every human being that's on this earth. Jesus told a story about a man who hung some land and he planted some grapes on that land and then he rented it to some other men to take care of it for him while he was away. And when it came time to harvest the crop, the landowner sent some of his servants to collect his share of the harvest. And the men who had leased the land beat the men's servants and even killed one of them. They refused to give the landowner what, he, what was due him. And the second time, the landowner sent his servants to collect what was due to him. And once again, his servants were treated the same way. And finally, the landowner sent his own son to the tenants. He thought surely they would listen to his own son. But when they saw the son, they said, this is the landowner's son. Let's kill him and, and take his inheritance. And Jesus asked the men that were listening to his story, what do you think the landowner will do to those men? He'll destroy those wicked men and rent his land to someone else who will give him his share of the fruit at the harvest time, answered his listeners. And in this story that Jesus told, the landowner was God. God first sent men such as Noah, Moses, David, the prophet Isaiah, and others to tell the people of his love for them and to call them to turn from their wicked ways but many would not listen. And finally, he sent his own son, Jesus. You know what they did to him? You know that story, don't you? That's right. They crucified him. They gave him a chance. God gave them a chance, and 
he even gave them a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. But when they rejected his son, that was their last chance. He is our last chance too. He is our only chance. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for sending us Jesus, your only Son, your only beloved, begotten Son. Help us to remember that he is our only chance to receive eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Our epistle lesson comes from Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, Philippians chapter 3, verse 4b through verse 14, and I'll be sharing it out of the message. You know my pedigree, a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and a devout adherent to God's law a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting Christians, a meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. The very credentials these people are waving around as something special, I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand. Everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant, dog dung. I've dumped it all down in the trash so I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules that when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. I gave up all that inferior stuff so that I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to the death itself. And if there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I have it made, but I'm well on my way, reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal, where God is beckoning us, beckoning us onward to Jesus. And I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. This is God's word for us, God's people. Thanks be to God. One of the ways that we move towards that goal is through prayer. Prayer is our time to fall in love with God. It's also a time when we can intercede for others. Pray with others when they make a request. That's being... When we do that, that's one way that we can help them bear their burdens. And when we have needs and we have burdens that we're bearing, we can ask others to come alongside of us to pray with us as well. We can also praise and thank God for the celebrations in life. And if you desire for someone to help bear your burdens, to pray with you and for you or to celebrate with you, you can call me or you can text me at 740-304-5133. Again, that's 740-304-5133. If you request that I share it with our prayer warriors, I will do so so that they can pray with you and for you as well. Otherwise, it will remain between you and me and God and whomever you choose to share it with. You can also email requests or praises to me at 
Pastor Rick at TunnelUMC.org. Again, that's Pastor Rick at TunnelUMC.org. Now, let's pray together in silence as you quietly lift up your concerns and your celebrations to the Lord for the next few seconds. Liberating God, in love you have set us free, free from slavery to sin and, and death and slavery to ourselves, free to know and to love you, free to follow and to serve you. We praise you for your, your faithful love towards us and for the many ways that you have demonstrated that love to us. And we see your love in the natural world around us and in the beauty of the trees and the, in the blueness of the sky and in the rivers that flow through this valley. We see your love and the, the gift of your commandments, the rules for living that guide us, that guide us into right relationship with you and, and with the people around us. And we see your love in, in Jesus Christ, who lived and died to bring us life. And because we have experienced your love, we, we come before you with confidence that you will hear us as your children as you because Jesus has gone before us and is there interceding for us we come bringing our our needs and the needs of our world and we pray for those that live surrounded by violence whether from war or civil unrest or political unrest, crime or domestic abuse. We pray for those have been who have been victims of, of violent crime, and for those loved ones who have been injured or, or murdered. And we pray for those who find themselves in, involved in crime, whether by choice or through coercion, those that are caught up in gangs or in prostitution, those who have turned to crime to pay for their addictions, and those who are imprisoned. We pray for our homes and our families, for parents juggling the responsibilities of work and family, and for those particularly that are affected by having their kids at home during this pandemic and having to teach them there as well. For husbands and wives, Lord, we pray for them, especially those whose marriages are breaking down. We pray for those children that are chafing under their parents' authority or their expectations. We pray for men and women that are caught up in adultery or adulterous thoughts. And we pray for the many people in our world who do not yet know you. They have not experienced the new life that comes from knowing Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, who continue to search for purpose and meaning Yes, merciful God, we place them in your hands. And we ask that you would give us strength and courage to, to keep your commandments, to live in, in, in faithful obedience to your will. 
guard our hearts and our minds from all that might distract us from living out our commitment to you. Help us to find our true worth in, in knowing you more fully and serving you more faithfully. In the name of Jesus Christ, our cornerstone, we ask this. Amen and amen. Our gospel lesson comes from Matthew 21, verses 33 through 46. And again, I'm going to be reading out of the message. So hear these words. And this is Jesus speaking. Here's another story. Listen closely. There was once a man, a, a wealthy farmer who planted a vineyard and he fenced it and he dug a wine press and he put up a watchtower and then he turned it over to the farm hands and went off on a trip. And when it was time to harvest the grapes, he sent his servants back to collect his profits. And the farm hands grabbed the first servant and beat him up. The next one they murdered. They threw stones at the third, but he got away. And the owner tried again, sending more servants, and they got the same treatment. And the owner was at the end of his rope. And he decided to send his son. Surely, he thought, they'll respect my son. But when the farmhands saw the son arrive, they rubbed their hands in greed. This is the heir. Let's kill him, and let's have it all for ourselves. And so they grabbed him and threw him out and killed him. And now when the owner of the vineyard arrives home from his trip, what do you think he will do to the farmhands? He'll kill them, a rotten bunch and a good riddance, they answered. And then he'll sign the vineyard to the farm farmhands who will hand it over, hand her over the prophets when it's time. And Jesus said, right. And you can read it for yourselves in your Bibles. The stone the masons threw out is now the cornerstone. This is God's work. We rub our eyes. We can hardly believe it. This is the way it is with you. God's kingdom will be taken back from you and handed over to the people who will live out a kingdom life. Whoever stumbles on this stone gets shattered. Whoever the stone falls on gets smashed. When the religious leaders heard this story, they knew it was aimed at them. And they wanted to arrest Jesus and, and put him in jail, but immediately, by public opinion, they held back. Most people held him to be a prophet of God. This is God's word for us, God's people. Thanks be to God. It's 33 AD. Jesus has been worshipped and praised as he entered Jerusalem on Sunday. What we know is Palm Sunday. He's cleared out the merchants from the temple and he's overturned the tables of the money changers. He's being watched very closely by the chief priests and the Pharisees. And among the crowd of the Pharisees is a young man who has been studying under Gamaliel, one of the most respected rabbis among the Pharisees. The young Pharisee isn't from Jerusalem, but is from Tarsus. He's been a student at the Greek school of rhetoric there. Zealous for Judaism, he is carefully observing the events that are surrounding this, this Jesus who seems to be undermining the religion he grew up with. And, and now he feels called to proclaim and to teach. This young Pharisee might have told the story this way. And Jesus begins to teach us uh, another parable. It was hard to understand what he was getting at in this story of a wealthy farmer who turned his vineyard over to farmhands. Farmhands who ignored and beat the servants that were sent to collect the prophets and then, and then killed the son. Jesus asked us what the landowner will do when, when he comes back and we answered, he'll kill them, a rotten bunch and good riddance. 
Then they'll assign the vineyard to farmhands who will hand over the profits when it's time. This one's not too bad yet. And then Jesus quoted our holy writings from our songbook, Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. The one about the stone being rejected, but then by God's work becoming the cornerstone. But he didn't stop there. He went on to point his finger at us, the religious leaders. In his words, saying that the kingdom of heaven was going to be taken away from us and given to those who will live out a kingdom life. How dare he? We need to silence him, throw him in jail. But what about the people? It won't set well with them. They think he's a prophet. Yeah, I know, there's no, there's no record of Saul of Tarsus being there. But it's very probable that he was. He was, after all, born legitimately. His parents being faithful Jews saw that he, he was circumcised according to the law when he was eight days old. He was one of God's chosen people, the Israelites, and he had a genealogy to prove it. It, it shows that he was a member of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew, born of Hebrews. And he has his birth certificate to prove it. And he could present it if need be. He lived and was taught as a Pharisee, which means he followed, which he means he followed that devoutly. Not only those Ten Commandments that we're all familiar with, but all 613 laws, rules, and regulations found in in or derived from the Torah. Cheeseburgers were taboo, no meat boiled in its mother's milk for him, no siree. He was a fiery defender of his religion. He agreed with the crucifixion of Jesus and afterwards persecuted the followers of Jesus. He held the coats as Stephen was stoned to death. And when it came to righteousness, he meticulously kept God's law. If you could earn your way to heaven, Saul was well on his way. And from a Jewish perspective, if his life story ended right there, he would have a great reputation. I mean, when I studied Jewish civilization under an Orthodox Jewish professor, he praised Saul for his knowledge of the Torah and accepted him as a Jew. But he went on to say that he was a demented Jew because he threw away such a great reputation. He could have been the next Gamaliel, but he threw it all away for what Saul saw as the great privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as his master. The change happened on that road to Damascus as Saul went to persecute the Christ followers there. And he was confronted on that road by Jesus. I know it's not quite Christmas yet. Maybe some of us are already thinking that, but I want you to remember Charles Dickens' famous story, A Christmas Carol. Remember how the ghost of Scrooge's business partner, Jacob Marley, uh, appears to him one night? I want you to listen to it again as Charles Dickens describes it. The chain he drew was clasped, clasped about his middle. It was long and, and wound about him like a, a tail, and it was made, for Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes and keys and padlocks and ledgers and deeds and heavy purses wrought in steel. You, you are fettered said Scrooge, trembling, T -t tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, replied the ghost. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will and of my own free will I wore it. Is this pattern strange to you? Scrooge trembled more and more. 
Or would you know, pursued the ghost, the weight and the length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full as heavy and as long as this, seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since. It's a ponderous chain. The ponderous change of religious respectability that Saul of Tarsus has spent half his life forging. He had the good sense to unwind from his from around himself and to abandon it once he met Jesus Christ. Saul gave up his identity and with it even his name. He became someone completely new. Paul, child of God, a disciple of Jesus. What he had once been no longer mattered. You know, we too can forge ponderous chains of religious respectability. Perhaps we've been raised in the church. We've been baptized and confirmed. We know the scriptures backwards and forwards. We know all the right answers. We're members of the founding families. We live by the rules and guidelines that good Christians ought to live by. We judge others who don't live up to our idea of right living and persecute them with words of condemnation, all in the name of persevering or preserving our view of what our church should look like. We act religious, but we reject the power that can make us godly. We are bound by those chains, just like Paul. When are we going to have the good sense to unwind them from around ourselves and abandon them and allow God to, to form us more and more into his image? When are we going to give up our identity? and take up his? When are we going to let God make us completely new, a child of God and a disciple of Jesus? From time to time, we come across things that are meant to sound or look like something they aren't. Perhaps the most positive version is the generic or the store brand medications that boasts that they have the same active ingredients as the better known products, but for considerably less money. At the other end of the spectrum, we find counterfeit currency or counterfeit art, <clears throat> worthless fakes that pose as articles of real value. In between, there's that whole array of products that endeavor to look and sound better than they actually are imitation leather, fake diamonds, gold-plated brass, knockoff designer clothes, and you probably could list so many more. And in so many instances, the value and the quality of the, the thing depends on its source. For example, a certain kind of genius might be able to come up with and make a $50 bill that is essentially identical to the one that is produced by the United States Mint. But it would not have the same value because it doesn't come from the authorized source. The same is true of an excellent imitation of a Picasso painting or a Michelangelo sculpture. Is this real leather? We ask the salesman as we slowly rub our hand along the back of a a handsome chair? Uh, no, not exactly. But it's genuine imitation leather, he assures us. Ah, we say, nodding and smiling, though secretly wondering what exactly we're buying. <laughs> Likewise, there may be some undesirable product that we might call genuine imitation righteousness. It's not made from the real thing. And so it doesn't have the enduring value or the beauty of the real thing. But at a glance, on the surface, it has the look. 
And the casual observer might walk by and say, ah, oh, righteousness. Looking at the gospel accounts, we can surmise that there was a good deal of genuine imitation righteousness among the Pharisees of Jesus' day. They should not be unfairly singled out, of course. For we certainly see evidence of the same sad thing happening among the hearers of, say, Isaiah or Amos or Malachi. We also see it happening in our day as well. However, we focus on the Pharisees because they're the main players in the Matthew reading this week. And they're part of Paul's pedigree in Philippians. In chapter 20 of Exodus, we find the Ten Commandments, uh, an example of God's law given for the slopes of Sinai. An example that Paul referred to a thousand or so years later, and that Paul claims that as to the law, he was a Pharisee, and as to righteousness under the law, he was blameless. So all, so Paul's good. I mean, he was blameless under the law, right? That's genuine righteousness, the real thing. No, for we know that that question of genuine or counterfeit depends on the source. And Paul has discovered that the real source is Jesus Christ. And he has set aside the righteousness of my own that comes from obeying the law in favor of the righteousness from God, which comes through faith in Christ. We're familiar with the scriptural exhortations to put aside our sinful ways and our habits. But we may not so may not be so well acquainted though with that need to put aside Paul's kind of righteousness, at least his old righteousness. We should, of course, if it's not the real thing. Righteousness is based on our own works, on our own merits on our own compliance with the law. These have the look, but they come from an inferior source. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, and from the New Living Translation, Paul admonishes us to stay away from those who will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Our invitation is to receive that righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ. Everything else is a cheap invitation. Is your righteousness real? Or is it a cheap invitation? Are you willing to throw out your great chip cheap? Are you willing to throw out your great cheap imitation reputation for one that is real and comes from the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as your master. Paul says everything else is dog dung compared to the freedom that comes from knowing Christ personally and experiencing his resurrection power which gives new life. Do you want to know him in a real way? It's more than a list of rules and regulations. It's all about a relationship with our resurrected Savior. He's waiting for you right now.
to his table all who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with Christ and with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and before one another. God, we mix up our wins and our losses, thinking that money and success make us more worthy and forgetting that you call us to, to lose ourselves in seeking you. We count our victories as our own and blame you for our failures, forgetting that all we are and all that we have is a gift from you. Forgive us, God, and teach us again to think as you do, knowing that loss for your sake is gain and that we have to lose our lives to gain your abundant life. In Jesus' name, amen. Even as the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart seek to be pleasing to God, God is seeking to please us. Through Jesus Christ, God has reached into our hearts and it transformed our very lives. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks, our thanks and praise. It's right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You have made one, or from one, every nation and people to live on the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. 
He commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. And today his family and all the world is joining at his holy table. And on the night that he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. And then he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And then after the supper was over, he took the cup. And he gave thanks to you, Lord. And then he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us that are gathered, whether virtually or in person. Pour your Spirit out wherever we are. And on these gifts of bread and wine and the ones that we have in each of our homes, make them for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with your church throughout the world and strengthen in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully in your name. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in that final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. The bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. So those of you that are at home, I invite you to take the bread that you have or whatever representation of bread you have and take it and uh, you can share it with one another. And if you're by yourself, you can share it with yourself. But this is the body of Christ that is broken for you. Take eat in remembrance of him. This is the blood of Christ that is shed for you. Drink it in remembrance of him as you serve one another or serve yourself. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for joining us by your Spirit in our homes, wherever we are, but also with your church all around the world as we celebrate this wonderful, eternal mystery that you have given to us, reminding us that we are part of your body wherever we are in this world. Help us to live into the mission that you have given us to make disciples of Jesus Christ for your glory now and forever. Amen. Press on, dear friends, forgetting what lies behind. Go forth renewed and refreshed to follow where Christ may lead. Press on, dear friends, straining forward with hope and courage. 
Go forth carrying the promise of God into the world. Press on, dear friends, building up the promises of Christ, our cornerstone. Go forth living as people who wish to bring God's heaven here on earth. Press on, dear friends, for you are the builders of God's world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.